Romans chapter 1 Gentiles under sin Romans is the crucial foundational doctrine for the dispensation of grace and is the most important book in the Bible for all to study and understand. As we begin to read and believe the Bible, His Spirit in us helps us to understand more. In Romans, Paul addresses the believing Gentiles but sometimes he identifies himself with the Jews and at other times with the body of Christ. Paul speaks of the present dispensational shift in several passages, 1 colon 1 11, 3 colon 21 31, chapters 9 to 11, 13 colon 11 14, 15 colon 7 16, 16 colon 25 27. Gentiles means nations. 1 colon 1 7 Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the holy scriptures, 1 colon 1. God called Paul to be an apostle, he was separate from the twelve apostles. As God's spokesman, Paul writes to the believers in the body of Christ in Rome but also speaks about the unsaved Jews and Gentiles and the first saved Jewish remnant. Jesus Christ, of the seed of David, was promised in the prophetic scriptures. Paul, who saw the ascended, risen, glorified Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and was blinded by his light, confirms that Christ was declared to the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of Holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, 1 4. Paul's ministry is to all nations, by whom, the Son, we have received grace and apostleship, for our obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. 1 5. The Romans are among the Gentile nations who were also called by Christ when they heard and believed the gospel. He salutes them from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God is able to dispense grace and peace to the world because of the cross of Christ. 2 Cor. 5.19, 1.8-17 Their mutual faith is spoken of throughout the world. 1.8-12 Paul longs to communicate the further revelation of the mystery that Christ has given him to the believers at Rome. Paul thanks God for them and prays that it will be his will for him to visit them after he has delivered a monetary gift to the poor Messianic Kingdom saints in Jerusalem, 15,24-28. He has been too busy ministering to visit and hopes they have been doing the same. But now he is ready to preach the gospel, justification by faith, to them also. Paul is not ashamed, he knows that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith, 1 16, 17. God revealed the need for his righteousness, philosophy. 3 9, our faith rests in what the Son did by his faith. We receive the righteousness Christ had by his perfect faith when we believe what he did. The power of God translates us out of Adam into Christ and justified us. We live by faith in what God said rightly divided. 1 18-23 Paul just finished speaking of the righteousness of God and now contrasts the unrighteousness of the heathen. Because God is righteous, he has wrath against all ungodly, unrighteous unbelievers who hold the truth in unrighteousness. How did the heathen become the heathen? They rejected God. They are without excuse because God has revealed himself to them since the creation of the world. His revelation in creation is enough to know about God, but not enough to know him personally, for this we need to read and study his word. God progressively gave the Gentiles up and over to their evil ways beginning at the Tower of Babel, Genesis 10 and 11, because when they knew God they did not worship him. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-foot beasts, and creeping things. 1 colon 21-23 they changed the glory of God and made idols, notice the devolution from men, to four-footed beasts, to creeping things. Unbelievers are under the wrath of God and the high standard of the law, but not the saved, 1 Tim, 1 colon 9. 1 colon 24-32 who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen, 125. 
the Gentiles were under Satan's power, Acts 26 verse 18. The ultimate lie will be Satan incarnate and Antichrist claiming to be Christ. After they rejected God for idols, God gave the Gentiles up to the unclean lust of their own hearts. From adultery to same-sex relations and then to a reprobate mind, they were not thankful or thinking about God. Israel was the covenant breakers, 131, they broke their covenant with God when they made a golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai, X19,8, 24, 7, 32, 4, 8. The more they degraded God in their minds, the more they lived degraded, perverted lives. The world has gone rapidly downhill during our own lifetime. A reprobate mind is lacking his spirit. They received the reward that was fitting for their dark evil deeds and minds. Paul gives a whole list of their sinful acts. They know that God will hold them accountable and that they are worthy of eternal death, but they still continue in their sin and take pleasure in following sinners. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Rom 2.16 KJB The Apostle Paul Romans chapter 2 Jews under sin 2 colon 1-16 The Jews are also inexcusable because they broke their covenant with God and they do the same evil things that they accuse the Gentiles of doing. Paul does not come right out and say that he is speaking about the Jews right away, he gradually reveals that he is addressing the Jews, so they will not be offended and will keep reading. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, unsaved, nor to the Gentiles, unsaved, nor to the Church of God, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 30 God's wrath is not only against the idolatry and sensuality of the Gentiles, but against the hypocritical self-superiority of religious pretense and abuse of spiritual privilege. Everyone who is unsaved is under God's wrath, including the Jews. But we, Jews, 2 colon 2, are sure that God will judge right. Do you think you will escape the judgment of God? 2 colon 3, God has been patient toward you. God would grant eternal life to those who keep the law perfectly, but no human could. 3 10, 23. God is fair, loving, and gentle. It is his rich goodness and forbearance and long-suffering that leads all mankind to change their mind about who he is and what he has done. 2 colon 4. You are hardening your impenitent, not willing to repent, heart and refusing to believe God and are adding to the crimes that you will be judged for at the GWTJ. 2 colon 5. God will judge every man according to what he has done. If you have never sinned, you will receive eternal life. 2 colon 7. But wrath to the disobedient unbelievers. Paul mentions the Jews by name in 2 colon 9. All sinners will perish, those who sin with the law, and those who sin without it. God is not a respecter of persons. He does not care if you are a Jew or a Gentile unbeliever. 2 11. Those who did not have the law will perish and those who had the law will be judged by it. Jews have to do what the law said, not just hear it. 2.13 When the Gentiles naturally obey the law, they show that they have the law written in their heart and their conscience is a witness either accusing or excusing them. Paul said that Jesus Christ will judge the secrets of men at the great white throne judgment according to my gospel. They will be judged by whether or not they are. Justified having received the righteousness of Christ, his life, his spirit, by faith in what God told them to believe, 216, GWTJ Revelation 20 verses 11 to 15. Paul says my gospel, 216, to differentiate his gospel from the gospel of the twelve. 2 colon 17 29 Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God, 217. Paul continues his stinging reprimand. The Jews put their trust in having the law and thought that made them right with God. The Jews boasted of having received God's law and were confident they could keep it, but they transgressed the law and could not keep the law they received. God's will was for the Jews to keep his law. Only the perfect Son of God who had the law in his heart could keep God's more excellent high standard perfectly. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God, yeah, thy law is within my heart. Psalms 40 verse 8 the Jews thought they were teachers of the blind Gentile babes, but they were no better. The Jews were equally guilty and morally corrupt. Do you who teach others know you break the laws you preach? Do you steal or commit adultery? You who abhor idols are you worshipping something besides the true God? The Jews had a form of knowledge in the law, but they did not have the true knowledge of God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through your hypocrisy as written in ISA.
52 5, which made their physical circumcision worthless. True circumcision is that of the heart and spirit, Deuteronomy 10 16, God is looking for a circumcision of the heart by faith, to believe that what God said about his son is true. Shall not the uncircumcised Gentiles when they do what the law says judge you as having transgressed the very law you received? Paul said the Jews do the same sins they accuse the Gentiles of. A Jew that is circumcised in heart and in the spirit by faith will have praise of God. 2:28, 29. Faith takes place in the heart when a decision is made to believe. Paul was not one of the twelve apostles. Here's how we know. 1. Matthias was the twelfth and the Bible identifies twelve apostles before Paul. 2. Paul didn't meet the requirement of being with them in the beginning from the baptism of John all the way through to his ascension. 3. Paul didn't meet the job description, he was not working under the post-resurrection great commission. We know because the twelve were sent to baptize their converts, but Paul said Christ sent him not to baptize. If Christ sends some to baptize and another not to baptize, they are not working under the same marching orders. They are not in the same ministry nor under the same commission. Therefore Paul was not working under had no part in the same commission as the twelve apostles. Romans chapter 3 The whole world under sin and justification explained. 3 colon 1 dash 8 What advantage is it then to be a Jew? What is so good about circumcision? The Jews had the advantage in every way. The foremost advantage of all was that unto the Jews, the circumcision, were committed the keeping of the oracles of God, the word of God. God entrusted them with receiving, writing, and making a multiplicity of copies of the Hebrew Old Testament and the New Testament outside of Paul's epistles. The local Gentiles' churches are to be the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Tim 3.15, and is also to make a multiplicity of copies of the word of God and translate it. What if some Jews did not believe? Does their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid, absolutely not. Even if some did not believe, God is still true. Let what God says and does be true and every man a liar that God might be justified when he judges, 3 colon 4. God was just to impute his righteousness to David so that David's sins did not condemn him to hell, 2 Sam, 12 colon 9, 13. Their unbelief does not affect that God decided to impute his righteousness. God was faithful and his son paid for all mankind's sins. God will judge righteously. But if our unrighteousness shows that God is righteous, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous to take vengeance on the unbelievers? Paul said he is asking a foolish question as a man would. Not at all. How shall God judge the world if there is no right and wrong? If the truth of God is made more obvious by my lie and gives him more glory, why does he judge me a sinner? Paul anticipates some ridiculous arguments that people may pose and he may have heard. Should we not rather continue to do evil, as some slanderously accuse us of saying that God may be praised? Those who say so justly deserve damnation. 3 9 18 Paul asks, Are we Jews better than the Gentiles? No, because we have proved in this letter that all are under sin. 3 9 God through Paul sums up unsaved mankind's hopeless, sinful condition by quoting a series of verses, PSA, 14 colon 1 dash 3. Ackle, 729, PSA, 5 colon 9, 10 colon 7, 36 colon 1, 140 colon 3, ISA, 59 colon 7, 8. There is none righteous, no not one, no fear of God before their eyes of unbelievers. They have together, Jews and Gentiles, become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. 319, 20 Paul writes, Now we, Jews, know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. 319, 20. Like a mirror the law showed all nations their sin because even Israel to whom God gave it, could not keep it. The law stopped everyone's mouths. The law is a schoolmaster to show lost Gentiles their sin and bring them to Christ. Yao. 324. The final verdict is that all the world is guilty before God. The purpose of the law was for mankind to have knowledge of their sin, not something that man should strive to keep to justify himself before holy God. God proved that no son of Adam, 512, Jew or Gentile, could keep the law. Both Peter's and Paul's group need his son's righteousness. 
3 colon 21 31 but now after Paul's sudden and miraculous salvation and call to apostleship by the personal appearing of the Son of God to him on the road to Damascus, God has made a dispensational shift and revealed all that the Son's blood has accomplished on Calvary through Paul. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, God circumvented the law, he removed the law from the equation by going through the sacrificial system. The law, the five books of Moses, and the prophets, the rest of the OT, witnessed that God was righteous to do so. Jesus believed the Father would do what he said and raise him from the dead, PSA. 1610. Even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, God imputes the righteousness of his Son unto all and upon all them that believe in time past and in the present. 325. 26. There is no difference in justification or salvation. Christ had the faith and obedience to go through with the Father's plan of redemption, the Son knew he was born for the purpose of dying in man's place, Matt. 2019. Luke 18 verses 31 to 34, 1 COR. 11 colon 23 dash 25, philosophy 2 colon 8, Hebrews 10 verse 5. Because of the faith of Jesus, God was able to impart his righteousness, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference in condemnation, all have come short of his glorious righteous Ten Commandments. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, sinners are justified freely by his grace through the redemptive work of his Son. The Father provided the Son as the propitiation, atonement. Propitiation is the act of appeasing wrath and gaining the favor of an offended person, an atoning sacrifice offered to God to fully satisfy his wrath and render him no longer angry against man. God was offended by Adam's and our disobedience. The Father had faith that his Son would pay for man's sin with his blood. The law could not justify anyone. God redeemed mankind through the sacrificial system which began in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3 verse 21, long before the law was given to Moses. The law is the ministration of death, Christ is the ministration of life needed. His spirit, his life, and his righteousness are the same thing. We receive that gift the moment we believe. By one cross God saved two groups. Paul explained that those in Abraham's bosom, Luke 16 verse 22, could receive his son's imputed righteousness and be taken to heaven after he rose. Their spirits are currently in heaven, 2 Cor, 12 colon 4, Heb, 9 15, 23. Knowing that his son would redeem and justify believers by the cross with his blood, God forbear or kept back his wrath and did not destroy the Old Testament believers, 325. Father God's wrath against man's sin was fully appeased and satisfied by his son's substitutionary blood sacrifice payment, the redemption price. The Father held back his wrath. Christ's righteousness is credited to those who died before the cross in time past. In the previous dispensation, to declare, I say, Paul is the due time testifier, 1 Tim. 2 colon 4 dash 6, at this time is righteousness, at the present time, the Father can remain righteous and declare a believer in Jesus righteous, 326. Believers in this dispensation receive his imputed righteousness and can be declared righteous by the righteous God, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God can remain just, and justly justify the believer in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works. Nay, but by the law of faith. There is no one that can boast because we are saved by faith in Christ and not by keeping the law, which no human could keep. Boasting is excluded because Christ kept the law perfectly and did all the saving. It is excluded by the law of faith, 8 colon 2, we only believe what he did. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. A man is justified by faith alone without deeds, works. No one could be saved by keeping the law because everyone had the sinful flesh. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, Paul answers his own question. Yes, he is the God of the Gentiles also. God justifies the circumcision, Israel, by faith, and the uncircumcision, Gentiles, through faith. Faith without works is what justified both Israel and the Gentiles. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yeah, we establish the law. The law showed the perfect standard of God's righteousness, which only the Son could keep because it was already in his heart, PSA. 40 colon 8b, Christ's redemptive work established the law.
We will never measure up to God's standard for righteousness. That's why Jesus went to the cross, was buried, and rose again. He paid the price for our sins, and all we do is believe. ICOR 15 colon 1 dash 4. Romans chapter 4 imputation explained using Abraham. For colon 1 dash 25, Paul spends an entire chapter to illustrate God's solution to man's sin problem, his son's imputed righteousness. Imputation was something that God had done in the past. The father was able to justify others in the past because he had complete confidence that his son would pay the sin debt. His son did not disappoint him with incomprehensible love, self-sacrifice, and courage he paid the ransom. Abraham and David were justified, received God's imputed righteousness by faith alone and not by something they did. It is the person that simply believes God and does not think that they can earn their salvation by their own works or righteousness by keeping the law, but trusts in Christ's work on the cross and resurrection, who is saved, for colon 5. Abraham believed that God would give him many descendants and make a nation out of him just as God had said. Because Abraham believed God, he received God's imputed righteousness, he did not work for it, for colon 3, Genesis 15 verse 6. When Abraham believed his faith was counted for righteousness. Does this blessedness, imputed righteousness, come only on the circumcision, believing Jews, or on the uncircumcision, Gentiles, also? Since Abraham believed while uncircumcised, he is the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, for 11. God gave Abraham the token that proved or sealed that he had while uncircumcised. Therefore, Abraham is the father of all them that believe that righteousness might be imputed to them also. He is the father of those who have faith as he did. Abraham believed and became the heir of the world not through the law, but by the righteousness of faith, for 13. The law points out sins. Righteousness does not come from keeping the law. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. For 14. If lawkeepers receive righteousness, then it is not received by faith, and the promise of righteousness by faith is made of none effect. If we think we must add any of our own works to what Christ has done, we make our faith. Null and void. If we say we added to our salvation by being water baptized, walking the aisle, confessing our sins, eating a wafer, doing good deeds, and so on, we insult the Father and imply that what His Son did was not enough. Anyone who adds their own work to Christ's finished work on Calvary is not saved. Therefore, it, imputed righteousness, is of faith by grace. God is gracious to impute his son's righteousness to the believer and give them eternal life. The promise was to all believers, not just those in the previous dispensation, all thy seed, for 16. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. For 17, people are spiritually dead before they believe and receive Christ's life. God called Abraham the father of many nations, Genesis 17 verse 5, because he calls those things that have not happened yet, as though they had, verse 17. God imputed his righteousness to Abraham knowing he would later receive his son's perfect righteousness. David's sins could only be forgiven if he had God's imputed righteousness. God did not impute iniquity to David because God had already imputed righteousness, his spirit, sure mercies, to David, for colon 6-8, 2 Sam. 12 colon 9, 13, PSA, 32 colon 1, 2. God demonstrated the extent of his forgiveness with King David, he is blessed and will have eternal life in the kingdom. Abraham did not look at his or Baron Sarah's old functionally dead bodies, but believe what God said. Abraham was strong in faith and fully persuaded, for 20, that God was able to give him the promised descendants. Faith is to be fully persuaded that what God said is true. Therefore, because of Abraham's faith, God imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone, that it, righteousness, was imputed to him, but for us, the body of Christ, also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised again for our justification, for colon 22-25. We are saved and justified when we believe that Jesus our Lord was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. Imputation was. In God's word all along, Genesis 15 verse 6, Psalms 32 verses 1 and 2, but until Paul was saved, God did not bring to the forefront his solution to man's sin problem.
Even now Satan tries to hide it. 2 Cor 4 colon 3 4 How do we earn righteousness? We don't. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for. Righteousness. Romans 4 verse 5 KJV Romans chapter 5 Result of Justification 5 colon 1 11 Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 5 colon 1, 2 The result of justification by faith is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice knowing that our sins are totally taken care of at Calvary. Since we have Christ's imputed righteousness, we can come and stand before the Holy Father without being obliterated. We have access to the Father and our standing by grace is perfect because of Christ's imputed righteousness by faith. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God in heaven, 2 Cor. 5 colon 1, we can relax because we have been set free from having to be punished for our sins. We glory in this present life which is preparing us for heaven. Our trials help us to grow spiritually. We glory in our infirmities, 2 Cor. 12 colon 9, or difficulties, because tribulations make us patient as we experience the doctrine working in us, 2 Cor. 4 17, 12 colon 9, 6 17. We are not ashamed of our hope because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us, 5 colon 5. Having the Holy Ghost, we have His love for God. Paul began the letter by saluting us from the Father and Son who are in heaven and the Holy Ghost is in us. Paul has mentioned all three persons of the Godhead. We had no power to save ourselves. Some would perhaps dare to die for a good man, but God loved us and Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 5 colon 8, being now justified by his blood and having received his righteousness, believers will not incur God's wrath, hell and the tribulation against unbelievers, 118, 2 Thess. 1 colon 9, 1 Thess. 1 10, 5 colon 9. The Father was reconciled to us by the death of his Son when we were his enemies, lost, but now that we have accepted God's friendship by believing we have his life working in us in this present life, 5 10. We have joy because we have been reconciled to the Father and have atonement, friendship takes two, now, in this dispensation, and his eternal life from the moment we were saved, 511. If we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, what else do we need? The answer is nothing. 5 colon 12 dash 21 Our justification in Christ is compared and contrasted with the condemnation we had been in Adam. Having talked about our sins, the wrong things we do, in this last section Paul speaks of sin, our sin nature. Sin entered the world through one man Adam and passed to all men, 512. However, the fact that God did not destroy Adam and Eve immediately meant that God had a plan. The similitude of Adam's transgression, Adam transgressed a clear rule or commandment of God. Men died in their sins even before the law was given to Moses. Adam is a figure of Christ. Adam is the federal head of lost mankind, while Christ is the federal head of saved mankind. Being in Adam is compared and contrasted with being in Christ to justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. 517, the free gift believers receive is the gift of righteousness. We can reign in this life and the life to come because of the gift of the Son's righteousness. Adam's sin condemned, Christ's free gift is available to all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's, Adam's, disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, Christ's, many were made righteous. 519, moreover, the law entered that sin may abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. One man brought sin, another righteousness. Sin reigned unto death, but grace reigned through his righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Salvation is not just as if I never sinned, no having the gift of his son's imputed righteousness is much greater, it is abounding eternal perfection. In Adam, or in Christ. Adam and the Law Comparison By one man's offense death passed upon all men. By one man's sin came condemnation. By one man's offense death reigned. By the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. 
Moreover, the law entered that sin may abound, make sin more obvious. As sin hath reigned unto death, Christ in grace, Christ's free gift, his righteousness, 517, by grace abounded unto many. Free gift of justification from offenses, gift of righteousness by grace by one, by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men to justification. Because of Christ, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Three Imputations Adam's Sin to Man Romans 5 verses 12 to 18 M.W. Man's Sin Christ's Righteousness to Christ to Man 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 Romans 4 verses 24 to 25 Believe 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 4 to be saved and sealed. Mads.